Hello and welcome back to another video. So in this case we are going to be doing a Dinky 719 Spitfire Mark II which was made sometime between 1969 and 1976. Now I think these came out originally as a uh, tie-in to the movie uh, Battle of Britain. And as you can see this is a Spitfire Mark II and it's made of metal and you can see it's been painted by hand but you may have noticed as you look through where the undercarriage is it's shiny metal I'll just show you that bit clearer which means it's never been painted so basically what this is this is a built dinky kit the original um, proper one would be like this so I've got two of these things I got at the same time a few years back and you can see from the factory they would have been sprayed all in one go so there you go. So as you can see, this is the kit, kit build, um, and we're going. This is what we're going to tackle. So obviously, it's got a few little issues. It has got its undercarriage. It's there, I swear. Okay, and you can see the propellers broke. So obviously, we get the new one of those. And you can also see the uh, the underside of the wing doesn't quite fit properly. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of bending to try and get that in. But I think, again, I, I don't know, it seems to me that the, the kits, the castings don't seem quite as good as the proper models. I'm probably going to get slagged for saying that. You might also notice something different about the wings on the kit version. You might notice that um, the wings are actually smooth over the transfers. Now, if, if you were to compare that to the pre-built model, You'll notice that the casting actually has a circle to show where the uh, wing randles go. I can get it to focus. There you go. So hopefully you can see that. So there's a there is a difference in the casting. Apart from that, I don't know uh, what other variations would have been done to the uh, Dinky Spitfire over time. But uh, the only one I can find is, is this uh, ridge around the randles to show where they go, which is obviously a feature they dropped because as you can see, they're all nice and smooth now. Now this model featured uh, a motor, which would spin the propeller, a uh, retractable undercarriage, uh, and to access the battery, you just took out the screw under the tail, which is plastic. That, case, that cover on the, on the bottom of the tail is actually plastic, it's not metal. Uh, and you can remove an N-type battery uh, to operate the propeller. Now the propeller doesn't use a switch to switch it on and off. Basically what it is is that the motor has to be flicked to get it to run and then to stop it, turn it off, you just stall the, stall the propeller and that's it. So we're just going to remove the battery cover which is held on with tape. Okay, so what you should be able to see is where you slot the battery in. As you can see, the battery is held on the terminal, which is stuck to the uh, the inside of the casting. And I'm just showing you here that the uh, plastic cover has actually still got its tail wheel, which is quite unusual. That often gets broke off. So uh, it's unusual to actually get that to survive. Okay, so as you can see, looking into the battery compartment, you can see it looks to be quite a big gob of solder down there, so we'll have to look, have a look at that. And this is an N-type battery, which is like a short AAA battery. Um, and the easiest way of getting these is to go along to your local uh, bargain shop, um, pound shop, euro shop, whatever, um, and you can get like a, a pack of, say, an N-type battery, another type of battery, and some button cells for, say, 150 something like that. And that's how I got these. Uh, I think there's even a Kodak brand. That does it, but it's much more expensive to buy the battery on its own. So you see the battery goes in, and how you get this to work is you give the propeller a flick, because what it is is that the uh, the commutator on the motor is only making electrical contact for say uh, 180 degrees of the turn of the, of the motor itself, and the rest of the time there's no contact, so it'll stop. So that's why if you stop it with your finger, it'll stop it and break the circuit. So that's me trying to get the battery out again. You always end up having to prise it out with something. I haven't got nails for it. Okay, so we've put a battery in. 
and we'll just see if we can start it. Now the little half turn it makes is actually the, the magnet in the motor turning the rotor to the off position effectively. So if you imagine the, uh, when, the when the rotor is uh, energised, uh, it then flicks it onto the, the magnetised side of it, if you know what I mean, and the magnet pushes it on the next bit, which will break the circuit. But, but because it's spinning, it's kind of like a flywheel effect and it'll keep going. Um, but as you can see, um, this one's not firing at all. So we'll take it apart and see if we can figure out what's wrong. Okay, so as you can see, uh, with the underside of the aircraft taken off, the undercarriage is really just, it's just really held against the spring. That's how it sort of stays up and stays down, if you see what I mean. So it's a very simple mechanism. Now I'm not gonna take that off because I'm a bit worried that if I remove that, um, press on washer thing, um, I might not be able to get it back on again. So I'm just gonna leave that on because it's nothing wrong with it really. And the undercarriage always ends up sagging. You'll always get like a bit of uh, floppy play in it. I remember the Hurricanes being like this as well. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so you can see on these, the wiring is very simple. It's literally the battery circuit goes um, to earth or to ground. It, I, I, it seems to run whichever way you put the battery in, or at least it has done for me anyway. Um, and then there's just one wiring connection from one end of the battery into the motor and then the circuit's completed by going through the casing of the motor into the casing of the aircraft. However, and I'll show you this in a little bit, the uh, pre-built models come with an earth wire or a, or a casing to battery terminal connection on the motor. So as you can see there, there's like a, a pretty hideous sort of soldering job there. So we're just gonna have a look at that. Okay, so here you can see the difference in the wiring between the two planes. So on the pre-built model, you can see there's this extra wire that goes from the motor to the battery to uh, make the circuit. And I think the reason for this is, is that the pre-built model, um, effectively, um, because, the mo because the casting's painted, it's insulated, and so you can't make a circuit once the uh, motor's in contact with the body of the aircraft. Whereas they're assuming, I assume, this is an assumption, that the uh, kit built ones, they assumed that no one was actually going to put paint on the inside of the aircraft and that there will still be a connection when the two halves are clamped together. They do sort of clamp the motor. Um, there's a little plastic, that loose thing's a plastic spacer that adapts the motor for the Spitfire. You'll find in uh, this different ad adapter thing in the Sea King helicopter. Um, I'm trying to think of another example of the ones I've seen. But basically, you can see there's a pretty hideous lump of solder on there. So, but at this stage, I'm looking at it thinking, well, maybe that's all right. So what we'll do is we'll just check it out with a multimeter. Now, just to show you guys, what I've done is I've taken the motor out and I've taken it apart. So basically, there's no sort of real brushes on this motor. It just uses two little hair-like wires to touch the commutator on the motor. So one is earth directly to the casing of the motor and the other is connected to the wire on the input which is the one on the right and the one on the left is the uh, the casing one and this is the commutator now can you can you see that there's only a connection for a few degrees of rotation oh come on focus technology what we need is young people right can you see that so largely it's really just uh, two pieces of foil on a piece of plastic uh, and so for most of the time when the motor's turning, it's not actually making an electrical connection. And so when the motor stalled, the magnet actually holds it in that broken state, the broken circuit state. And it's just relying on uh, in a, in like a flywheel effect to keep going. And so you can see there's only one magnet and that's just to guarantee that it, it parks in that position. There you go, it'll focus eventually. Don't know why I'm worrying. So you see there's a little bit little magnet in there. So when you look at these motors, you'll notice that the shaft is actually offset to the motor slightly. Okay, now I couldn't see anything wrong with the uh, the motor internally. Uh, sometimes when these things won't run, it's just basically that commutator gets dirty. Um, but anyway, just a quick flick of it, it still wasn't going. So I thought I'd just check that we we're making good connection. So here I'm just using a multimeter set to ohms 
see if I can park it in the right position and measure the uh, you know the resistance changing as it goes over the uh, over its uh, through its uh, turns. I'm trying to think of a way of explaining that. Top dead center. Right. So hopefully what you'll see when I get the uh, prong set up. I'll give the motor a little twist and the resistance should change as you're turning. It's just got open circuit, resistant, uh, some sort of a value, open circuit. It's just because I'm not holding it properly. So that, to me, I think that means the motor's working. Okay, so the, uh, the motor I think is working, but I thought I'd have a look at this dodgy soldering and if you actually look it's actually dry. Can you see that? The wire isn't actually soldered to the terminal, it kind of goes through the terminal and it's trapped by the blob of solder. But it's not the solder isn't the terminal itself has not been soldered. So what I've done now is I'll cut that brown wire off and it's blobby soldering and um, replace it with a new wire and done a slightly better job of dad soldering if you know what I mean and the motor's running. And as you can sort of see, all you do is you stop it and start it, and it runs. Now, I've always thought these run a little bit flaky. They they never sort of run very smooth. They're always like a cough, 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 cough sort of thing, but uh, it works. Okay, so having got the engine working, I can now say uh, I've got a Spitfire engine working. Um, how many people can say that? We're just going to dismantle the plane and strip all the parts off of it. Okay, and I think whilst this is all going on, I think I was listening to Simple Minds I Travel. So there you go, so that's more of my early 80s uh, music cred, <laughs> such as it is. Okay, so just taking the little exhaust stubs off. There's not an awful lot to the stinky Spitfire, to be honest. Now what I'm gonna do here is I've taken off the wheels, and I've done that by just uh, pinching the ends of the little shafts, ah, oh, focus, okay, and pull them out. Now, to put them back on, I probably will just cheat and glue them back in, to be quite honest, because um, I don't really have a tool that I'd be confident in peening that out without damaging something. Okay, so as to continue the theme of not being child-friendly, uh, we're going to put these in hot water. I think this is actually a fuzzy felt tin that I found in the shed from one of the kids' toys from years ago. Won't play with it now. And um, what we're going to do is we're just going to lob some, not sorry, gently put in some caustic soda and remove that paint. And I think it'll come off quite quick and easily because it's just, just humbral brush paint. So I'm just putting more water in to cover it. Okay, as anyone who's seen uh, Carry On Screaming, we should all be chanting now, frying tonight. <laughs> and we'll get this paint off. Satisfyingly starts fizzing. Something very satisfying about the way caustic soda strips paint. I think it's the lack of effort required on your part combined with the fact that it just sort of just gently removes it all. There you go, you can see the randals coming off and everything and it will take everything off. All right, and you can see it just with a little bit of agitation, it's all coming off. And we have the added bonus that will have a very clean drain afterwards. Okay, so straight out of the uh, uh, bath, having just get washed off with uh, clean water, you can see we have a nice aeroplane. You can see, you know, with the, almost where like the lines for the, uh, the roundel circle and the casting was. Um, so as you can see, it's all come out quite well, nice and clean. Copper comes up pretty well actually as well, comes up nice and shiny. Right, so basically what we'll do is we'll get this dried off and we'll do a bit of buffing. Okay, first things first. So having uh, cleaned up the metalwork, we are now just going to uh, spray everything with a coat of primer. I'm just using some Tamiya grey primer because I've got a large can of it. I'm just trying to use it up. It doesn't really matter. Other primers are available and I suspect they work just as well. And obviously the extractor is very handy on a cold day like this. So I can actually spray this inside 
Although to be honest, it's, you can still smell it in the room afterwards. So after I spray these things, I just generally go and go and do something else whilst the uh, the room clears properly. Okay, so whilst the primer's drying, I'm going to look at the paints that I'm going to use. So basically, I'm just going to use some Vallejo uh, colours, which are kind of uh, sort of standard Battle of Britain paint scheme. So we're going to use the paint scheme on the Hurricane here, which is your classic dark green, dark earth and sky type S. Now O'Donnell on this particular example here is actually a bit green and the uh, sky type S is the closest match to the original paint scheme. But again this will actually be more uh, of a proper colour scheme rather than the dinky one which is a bit bright. It's not really realistic. Okay. So I'm just showing you the colours here, so that's Dark Earth, which is the brown, that's me being patronising, I hope not everyone thinks I'm talking down to them, and it's Dark Green, which is the green, and it's not a bad match actually, and then you've got the Sky Type S, which is very similar to what's on the, on the model. Okay, so sp spraying the uh, underside of the wing and the battery compartment cover, because that makes up the tail. I'm doing these in the style of which Dinky would have did them originally. I'm not going to try and do a accurate uh, paint camera scheme as if I was doing a model. So I'm kind of going to honour the way that Dinky would have sprayed and put it together, if you see what I mean. I'm just going to use slightly more accurate colours. Okay, I'm just painting the inside a bit, just for the sake of it. Okay, so now I'm spraying the upper casting, uh, the same colour, because obviously the lower wing surfaces are on the upper casting and the tail plane. So I, just, I think I just had a blockage then. Okay, and we're just going to spray those. And then we're going to leave all these to dry. Okay, so now I've masked off the undersides. I'm now spraying the lighter colour, which is the dark earth over the rest of the aircraft now. Okay, so now we've painted it the dark earth colour. We're now comparing it to the factory plane. And what we're going to do now is we're going to mask the model up to resemble that camouflage pattern. Not exactly. Now, ideally, I would really like to be doing this with, say, blue tack. Uh, because you can get the nice curvy lines. You can also get a little bit of a soft edge. But I don't have any to hand at the moment, so what I've done is I've just basically cut the masking tape. The only problem with doing that is, is the edges were a bit hard, but uh, it'll be all right. It'll, it, should be, it, should be, it shouldn't be too bad at all. Okay, so I'm just showing you the dark green paint, which I'm going to put in the cup of the airbrush. You don't have to use an airbrush for this. Um, to be honest, you can probably get all these colours in cans. Or probably even your local uh, car shop might actually have car paints which are very similar. It's always worth having a look at these things. Okay, so we're just spraying the masked model now, the uh, dark green. So obviously, always remember, it's best to work from uh, light to dark. You can work the other way around, but you're just making things very hard for yourself because you're going to put extra, extra coats on to overcome the darker colours with the lighter colours. Right, and so we'll move on to uh, taking the masking tape off and see how it comes out. I think I used far too much tape in doing masking, but I think it's always better to overmask something than undermask it. So I'll just go into a bit of high powered speed now. I think this is this is like in between coats. I think it was a day because I only had time to sort of spray one thing, clean up, go back to doing family stuff, come back from college, etc. Um, and you know, so basically, this is like about four days later, five days later, maybe. So here's our plane. It's a bit sharp. Now, I'm just showing you this because what I've done is I've added an extra wire. This is the uh, 
uh, factory built model. I'll just show you that wire that goes to the casing of the aircraft on the factory built model. So what I'm going to do, or have done, is I've actually wired, soldered up a wire to do the same job. Because I think having painted it, um, making a good earth, or a good electrical circuit around the motor may not work. So you can see there I've put uh, this brown wire and I've soldered it to directly to the battery terminal. On the factory made model it's actually soldered near the stud at the bottom but either way it won't interfere with the battery where, where I've done it. And so we should have no problems with uh, an electrical circuit in the future. Okay just screwing the, wing, the lower wing on and the battery cover, I'll just speed it up for you. I think I was listening to Susie and the Banshees at the time I was doing this. It was a Spellbound, I think. There you go. It's much, much, much quicker when you can just pass, fast forward. Okay, so now I'm going to put the decals on, which are actually stickers. They're not water slide transfers, because they're imitating the original way these things were built. I think if you want to get a better result, I would recommend getting the water slide transfers. Because you can see the markings are done like a quite a thick plastic and the uh, wing markings and tail are actually paper stickers which is how I think Dinky originally did it. Now just for comparison this is a Airfix 172nd Spitfire compared to the Dinky one. As you can see the Dinky one's about 10% bigger and a bit fatter. Um, so basically if you've got a Dinky and you want cheap transfers you could probably just get a set of transfers off of an Airfix kit frankly and uh, they'll be just as good. Uh, I don't think anyone would actually notice because of the scale, but it's very close. Anyway. Now, someone commented in an earlier video about using tweezers to put uh, stickers on, uh, which I think is a very good idea, but I only saw that comment after I'd filmed this. So, oh well. Either way, it came out okay. I was careful. Ish. Okay, so we'll put the tail markings on, which you put on the on the uh, tail fin. You don't put them actually on the rudder itself, and it's like red to the front. And again, we just peel those off, and they are quite fit. This is where I wish I'd use the tweezers instead of my fat fingers. I couldn't see what I was doing with the camera in the way, so I did them off camera. So I apologise about that. So here we've moved on to putting the side transfers on, the squadron markings. I was so engrossed in what I was doing, I didn't quite get it in shot. I'm sorry about that. I shall have to sack the cameraman. Ah, oh, that's me. So as you can see, we've got different markings for this Spitfire compared to the original dinky one. So we've got our own little uh, squadron going. So here I'm just gluing the pins of the undercarriage wheels in place carefully so that the uh, tyres can still turn without gluing them solid. So it's just the ends of the pins, I've got a tiny little dab of uh, glue on them. Okay, so we're just putting the canopy on, which is a third party man remanufactured canopy which is quite easy to put on, but I'm just making a complete pig's ear of it. There you go, I'll just hide that in the edit. No one will ever know. Okay, so here I've just pressed the exhaust stubs back on. They're just really just held on with a good squeeze. Uh, no need to glue them or anything like that. And the very last thing to do is to actually put the aerial on, which I always thought was a bit oversized but it's there, so that's what we're going to use. Okay, and now the best bit, which is to fit the propeller. Just give that a squeeze on. It's a bit rough on the back surface of this one, but uh, should be okay. So we'll just squeeze that on. Give it a crank. Need to get the choke going. 
there you go, it's knocking it the wrong way, there you go. I've always thought these motors run a bit um, clattery, if you notice, they're not very smooth, and they do randomly stop, I've always found. Um, but anyway, so it's going, um, it's looking a lot better than it was, so I think we'll get this on turntable and see what you think. Okay, so here we are with our nice Spitfire Mark II running away. So we've replaced the propeller, replaced the canopy, we found uh, an aerial for it, we've repainted it, we've gotten the motor going and done a bit of wiring, and it's looking quite presentable now. So, if you like what you see and would like to see more videos, please subscribe, please click the notification uh, bell, and uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.